Welcome fellow aviators and welcome back to part five in this series. My name is Greg and today's video will cover the glide slope. If you haven't watched part two on stalls or part three on slow flight, I highly recommend checking out those videos before trying for the first time any of the techniques mentioned here. Flying a stabilized approach on a fixed glide slope is one of the more challenging tasks we have as pilots. That's true in both full-scale aviation as well as in model aviation. Like precision aerobatics, it takes both knowledge and skill, laser-like focus while also maintaining situational awareness and lots of practice. The reward for a job well done, though, goes beyond just landing your plane safely without damage. It's the satisfaction that you made it happen and luck played no part. It's the confidence that you can do it again every time. One thing I need to point out before getting into today's topic is the difference between a flap to elevator mix and flight mode trim. Both adjust the elevator position, but they work independently. I talked about my aircraft setup in part one, but failed to mention the flap to elevator mix. That mix is completely separate from elevator trim and independent of flight mode. The flap to elevator mix is activated automatically anytime the flaps are lowered. That mix is set up first and designed to prevent ballooning at pattern speeds by mixing in some down elevator. That works well for speeds below 40 knots for the Avanti. Landing mode is then switched on and the elevator is trimmed up for best speed on approach. That trim setting is saved only in landing mode and only activated when switching to that flight mode on entry into the pattern. Now you can land with partial flaps or full flaps without adjusting trims, or dirty up for a slow flyby without switching into landing mode. Once both are set, there is no need to change them unless aircraft weight or CG are changed. If you have a better way of setting this up, let me know in the comments below. If we unravel the landing pattern into a single line and look at it from our position on the ground rather than from the air, we get a profile or elevation view of the pattern. Each leg shown in the plan view of the landing pattern is noted here in the profile, as well as my typical landing checklist. I complete all of this on the downwind leg so I can focus on flying the plane through the descent. Landing mode on, slow below 40 knots, gear down, half flaps, slow to 30, full flaps at the start of the approach or by final. Landing checklist complete. The length of the downwind leg is typically just the runway length plus the final leg. The runway here is roughly 600 feet, at a maximum of 600 feet for final, for a total length of 1,200 feet on downwind. I usually stand 200 feet from the end of the runway and touch down there, so that reduces the final leg beyond the runway to 400 feet and the downwind leg to a total of 1,000 feet. The Avanti covers that distance in about the time it takes to complete the full landing checklist. The base leg is the distance flown through a 180 degree turn, which is the circumference of half a circle or pi times r. The radius is half of our downwind offset or 250 feet. The base leg is then pi times 250, which equals 785 feet. In order to draw the landing profile with a realistic glide slope, I use the numbers from my Avanti. After several flights with telemetry, I noticed that when the Avanti was on a good glide slope, it was averaging 25 knots on final and descending at about 200 feet per minute, plus or minus 50 feet. On a calm day, that means ground speed is roughly 42 feet per second, covering 2,530 feet in one minute. Now we have H and D, so we can solve for the glide slope, or approach angle, gamma. That is the inverse tangent of 200 divided by 2530, which equals 4.5 degrees. Knowing the glide slope and the point where I want to start my approach, I can now calculate the ideal altitude to be at on downwind. The distance flown on approach is the sum of the base and final legs, which equals 1,385 feet. The starting height, h, equals the distance, d, times the tangent of 4.5, which equals 109 feet. So, ideally, I want to be at that altitude when I start my approach. If you've flown the same approach hundreds of times, 
it's amazing how accurate you can get at judging altitude and consistently place your plane where you need it. I programmed my three position gear switch to read altitude in the middle position. When lowering gear on downwind, I briefly pause in the middle to listen to altitude and often find I'm close to 110 feet on the downwind leg. Anything from 75 feet up to 200 feet has also worked for me. The higher the headwind, the higher you can start your approach or the later you can begin your descent while maintaining the same descent rate. However, an alternative is to just turn to base sooner. For example, and please check my math, with only a 10 mile per hour wind down the runway, I can start the turn from downwind to base at just over 100 feet past my touchdown point. If I follow the normal pattern and approach with that much wind, I would end up landing well short of the runway. A steep approach allows you to clear any turbulence down low along the approach path. If you need to make an emergency landing, but find yourself too high, a forward slip will allow a steep descent without increasing airspeed. A steeper approach will also be closer to the engine out glide path, which may allow you to make it to the runway if your battery dies or turbine flames out. If you do lose a motor or turbine on approach, never try to stretch the glide path by pulling back on the elevator. That will have the opposite effect, steepening the descent and forcing an early touchdown. Let's take a moment to look at the effect flaps have on the approach and landing. Flaps increase lift up to about 15 degrees, then they primarily increase drag. This allows for a steeper approach without increasing airspeed. They also allow you to lower the nose, reducing AOA and increasing the stall margin. Finally, flaps lower airspeed at touchdown and shorten the rollout. These are all beneficial effects. So when would you not use flaps or use only partial flaps? Anytime there is a strong headwind, it's a good idea to reduce flaps. A strong headwind has the same effect as adding flaps, steepening the approach angle. To avoid landing short, it's necessary to reduce flaps or increase power to compensate. When there are no obstacles to clear, a low approach of three degrees can also work. This might be flown at a higher approach speed. For the Avanti, that might be 30 knots with 160 foot per minute descent rate, but you could also drag the plane in at 25 knots with a slightly higher power setting to get a descent rate of only 133 feet per minute. To achieve a lower descent rate, more power is required since vertical speed V sub V equals power. Notice that power is proportional to vertical speed, so a higher vertical speed increases the energy state of the plane. To compensate for that, we need to use a lower power setting whenever we choose a higher descent rate and a higher power setting for a lower rate. A higher descent rate does not necessarily mean a higher approach path, as I showed earlier. It's good to practice a steeper approach, though, in case you find yourself at a new airfield with a short runway and obstacles to clear. On those days when winds are light, 110 feet is a good starting altitude for my typical approach providing a glide slope between 4 and 5 degrees and an easy descent rate of 200 feet per minute. My target landing spot on our Geotex runway is typically right in front of where I'm standing, about 200 feet past the approach end of the runway. That leaves over 300 feet to roll to a stop, which is plenty for the Avanti, even with no wind to slow it down. That may seem like a lot of runway to leave unused, but there is an advantage to landing long when the conditions are gusty or the wind direction is constantly shifting, as often happens at our field. This can lead to wind shear on approach with the potential to slam your plane to the ground unexpectedly. It's happened to me, as you can see here. It's better for the plane if that happens over a smooth surface rather than a rough field. Even on relatively calm days, you may find yourself getting a little slow on approach and coming in lower than planned. As long as you catch your descent rate, it's good to have runway below you to touch down early when this happens. If the golden rule in aviation is aviate, navigate, then communicate, the rule for landing is don't screw it up or something like that. Actually, there are four parameters we can manage to achieve a great landing every time. Those are airspeed, attitude, altitude, and alignment. 
I covered alignment in part four, so that leaves airspeed, attitude, and altitude. What we really need to watch is AOA, which is roughly the difference between where the nose is pointing and where the plane is going. Wing incidents can add a few degrees to that. I think watching that from the ground is easier than in the cockpit with no AOA, but it's still not precise. Attitude is not only easy to spot at a glance, it's what we have direct control over. Airspeed and attitude together give us a close approximation to angle of attack, but more on this in a minute. We can't generate lift without airspeed, so that is an obvious priority. It's easy to get distracted though, especially if there are other planes in the air, other pilots talking nearby, a change in approach with a shift in winds, or an unfamiliar airfield. Just remember, if you want an A on your landing, you need to focus on the four A's, airspeed, attitude, altitude, and alignment. Am I repeating myself? Good. To take that to the next level, it helps to put those words into a sight picture. A sight picture is just a mental image of the approach path and what the plane should look like at any point on that path. I had to shorten the final leg in this picture to get it to fit, but this gives you an idea of what I mean. The Aerofly Sim does not play nice with my transmitter, so the BAE Hawk does not have a much needed flap to elevator mix in this simulated landing. My apologies in advance for the ballooning and I extend full flaps on the turn to base. There shouldn't be any pitch change. With pitch set for speed, good throttle control, and following the right sight picture for your plane, you can bring her safely home every time. If your plane does not have an airspeed sensor, then you will need to judge airspeed based on ground speed, track, and attitude. Just remember that with a tailwind, airspeed will always be lower than ground speed. On a windy day, then, Keep the nose down and the throttle up on the downwind leg. Using a GPS for airspeed can get you into trouble, especially if you forget to adjust for the wind. Remember that wind speed usually increases with altitude, so while it may be calm on the runway, it could be blowing 10 miles per hour or more at pattern altitude. If you've been flying for a while, and particularly one airplane, you know your airplane's flight envelope. So, for example, if your plane is flying level on downwind, not climbing or descending, and the attitude is nose high, you know you're slow and close to a stall. In fact, if your plane is nose high anywhere in the pattern, but especially on descent, it is slow and close to a stall. That's not necessarily wrong, and in fact, may be necessary to slow down if you're flying a delta wing, but just be aware of the reduced margin for error. Beyond that, you will need to rely on your experience with your specific plane to keep it at a safe speed. Stalls are a normal part of every sequence in Pattern and iMac. By practicing them, along with slow flight on a regular basis, you can get comfortable with that end of the flight envelope. Attitude follows airspeed and priority, but the two are really tied together, giving us an approximation for AOA. We have some margin for error with angle of attack, from about 15 degrees when we're fast to about 10 degrees when we're on a standard approach. We can get a sense of AOA by comparing the pitch attitude with the track the plane is flying on, or by watching the combination of airspeed and attitude. Basically, on one end we have high airspeed and a nose low attitude, which indicates a low angle of attack, and on the other end a low airspeed with a nose high attitude, indicating a high angle of attack. In general, the lower the airspeed, the higher the AOA. For reference, when the Avanti is stabilized with full flaps at 25 knots, the wingtips are at about 4 to 5 degrees angle of attack, providing at least 10 degrees of margin before stalling. The root section, of course, will stall before that, especially with full flaps deployed, providing some warning to the pilot before there is a loss of control.
Here's a fascinating video of a one-fifth scale EAE Hawk with a custom AOA sensor. Notice the pilot has highlighted in green the ideal approach speed and AOA numbers. This is what we can achieve when good telemetry is coupled with good programming. But as mentioned in part two on stalls, we can easily exceed the critical angle of attack at any airspeed or any attitude. In the case of an accelerated stall, it can happen without warning. So how do we avoid that? One technique is to remain light on the sticks. In other words, don't pull hard when you're slow and keep the elevator stick close to neutral. Watch how little elevator is needed on this short, low, and rather aggressive approach. Full deflection is only 10 millimeters, and that only happens in the flare. The elevator deflects less than 6 millimeters for most of the approach. The control surface position indicator is flipped for this rear view to show left rudder and left aileron on the right side to match their actual movement. The ideal glide slope is any stabilized approach path that gives the pilot precise control over the touchdown point. This aviation safety brief from the FAA describes a stabilized approach that can just as easily apply to RC model jets. A stabilized approach is one in which the pilot establishes and maintains a constant angle glide path towards a predetermined point on the landing runway. It is based on the pilot's judgment of certain visual clues and depends on the maintenance of a constant final descent airspeed and configuration. Chapter 8 of the FAA Airplane Flying Handbook covers approaches and landings and gives a more detailed description. The objective of a good stabilized final approach is to descend at an angle and airspeed that permits the airplane to reach the desired touchdown point at an airspeed that results in minimum floating just before the touchdown, in essence, a semi-stalled condition. To accomplish this, it is essential that both the descent angle and airspeed be accurately controlled. Since on a normal approach the power setting is not fixed as in a power-off approach, the power and pitch attitude are adjusted simultaneously as necessary to control the airspeed and the descent angle, or to attain the desired altitudes along the approach path. By lowering the nose and reducing power to keep approach airspeed constant, a descent at a higher rate can be made to correct for being too high in the approach. This is one reason for performing approaches with partial power. If the approach is too high, merely lower the nose and reduce the power. When the approach is too low, add power and raise the nose. Links to these sources are in the description. The carrier landing challenge in Flight Sim 2020 is great practice for flying a stabilized approach. To stay on glide slope, you have to balance pitch and power while staying on speed. Notice the connection between angle of attack and speed. Pitch controls airspeed. Pitch up to reduce speed. Pitch down to increase speed. Throttle controls position on the glide slope. Add power when sinking below it. Reduce power when rising above it. It's a delicate balance that requires many small adjustments to pitch and power. When the plane is too fast for the glide slope, that is the pitch attitude is too low, a red chevron pointing up will light up. The pilot must raise the nose to get back on speed. If the plane is below the glide slope, no increase in power is required. When too slow, a green chevron pointing down lights up. The correct response is to lower the nose. If above the glide slope, no reduction in power is necessary. When on speed, an amber donut lights up, and any deviation from the glide slope will require both throttle and pitch to correct. If you'd like to see my attempt at landing on the carrier, stick around for the bonus footage at the end. The usual depiction of the four forces of flight thrust, drag, lift, and weight, show them in balance when an aircraft is in level 1G flight. But this is also the case when an aircraft is on a stabilized approach. It's slightly more complicated because each force now has two component vectors that must be accounted for. At the start of the approach, and then only briefly, we let weight exceed lift by either reducing throttle or adjusting pitch, or both. Once established on the desired glide slope, the combination of all component vectors should be in balance again until, ideally, we begin the round out and transition to touchdown. In slow flight, 
the angle of attack is high enough that a significant component of thrust is perpendicular to the direction of flight, in this case, the glide slope. The vertical scale in this graph is exaggerated to help illustrate the component vectors. Excess thrust doesn't have to be enough to actually climb in altitude, but only depart from the glide slope by not descending at the desired rate. If pitch is set with trim, remember, pitch controls speed, and not adjusted when thrust is increased, the aircraft will nose up to maintain the speed that was set. The higher AOA will increase lift, and the aircraft's rate of descent will decrease, departing the glide slope. This may or may not result in actual gain in altitude. Either way, from our vantage point on the ground, any departure in front of and above the glide slope will appear as a climb. Similarly, a reduction in thrust will cause the aircraft to nose down to keep the original speed. The lower AOA will decrease lift and the aircraft will descend. From our vantage point on the ground, it looks like the plane is climbing or descending based on thrust alone. In reality, the change in thrust upsets the delicate balance of forces at play, changing pitch, which changes the AOA and thus the amount of lift. I'll come back to this in a minute, because there's another way to look at the dynamics here, and that is in terms of total energy and energy distribution. Meanwhile, our goal is a smooth descent, not a roller coaster ride. In my book, if I'm up and down and all over town on the approach, but happen to pull it together at the last second for a greaser, that was still a poor landing. That was luck, not skill. This graphic from AOPA summarizes the key elements of energy management and what control inputs are needed on a stabilized approach. Point A in the center is where we want to be, on glide slope and on speed. An energy distribution error happens when we apply the wrong pitch control. So anytime we use the elevator to trade too much speed for altitude, the plane will be high and slow. If we trade too much altitude for speed, it'll be low and fast. Energy distribution errors only need a change in pitch attitude to correct. This is the conventional adage, pitch controls speed. A total energy error happens anytime we put the energy state of the plane out of balance. Like a bank account, we can either overdraw or have a surplus. Unlike our bank accounts, though, even a surplus is bad, although better than low and slow and overdrawn. So, the energy state will become too low if we allow drag to exceed thrust for too long. Conversely, we'll end up with a surplus if we keep the throttle too high for the amount of drag holding us back. Either error causes a deviation from the glide slope and requires a correction with throttle. This is the other half of that adage, throttle controls altitude. This leaves four scenarios that we still have to contend with. On speed and high, on speed and low, on glide slope and fast, on glide slope and slow. Each of these situations will require a combination of elevator and throttle corrections. For on speed and high, we need to reduce throttle and pitch down. For on speed and low, we need to add throttle and pitch up. On glide slope and fast requires reducing throttle and pitching up. On glide slope and slow requires adding throttle and pitching down. All of these combinations of throttle and pitch settings can create a large workload for the pilot trying to maintain a stable approach. That is why I highly recommend spending a couple flights to work out the best trim setting for your airplane. You may need to tweak that for different conditions, but it will definitely reduce the workload and make the approach more stable and more enjoyable. So, in summary, a stable approach follows a set glide slope, which then helps to control speed and the precision of the touchdown point. If airspeed and altitude fluctuate wildly, the aircraft is not stabilized. If the aircraft climbs easily when you pull the nose up, you're too fast. If the aircraft balloons during the roundout, climbing rather than continuing to descend, you're too fast. An unstable approach is what you have when you dive towards the runway and then flare late, hoping to bleed off speed before the runway ends. Once the plane reaches the runway threshold, I begin gently pulling back on the stick to begin the roundup. If done gradually, 
with the plane on speed, that is, at or close to V-Ref, the nose will slowly lift up and the plane will slow down, like tapping on the brakes. This transition typically reduces the airspeed on my Avanti another 5 knots, from 25 down to 20. At that point, the plane should be just inches from the runway and ready to flare. As soon as it begins to settle, I bring the elevator stick all the way back to get the nose up as high as it will go. Remember, I'm on low rates, so that may be no more than 15 degrees nose up at most. With more aggressive rates, your results may differ. Forcing a plane to land before it's ready, landing with excessive speed, or using too much runway to bleed off speed rather than going around can lead to a runway overrun, which can easily damage gear, or worse, especially when landing on a rough surface. An unstable approach is a common factor contributing to this kind of damage that's completely unnecessary. Always touch down on the mains. Hitting the nose wheel first may cause damage in a series of bounces or pilot-induced oscillations. They can get progressively worse and become very hard to control. In some cases, pilot-induced oscillations, or PIO, can cause a plane to flip over in an instant if the wrong controls are applied. It's best to simply go around and try again. Ground effect can lead to an early flare and stall well above the runway. The key to avoiding it is a stabilized approach at the correct speed. If you come in hot, your plane has a much higher chance of ending up in ground effect. That begins when the plane is within a wingspan of the runway, but the effect is most noticeable below half a wingspan. There are some misconceptions around this. It is not a bubble of compressed air that supports the wings. It may feel like that, or like a puck on an air hockey table. It is a very real effect though, which can do some damage if you get into it. A plane can float down the length of the runway in ground effect. That happened to my iMac plane at a contest on a hot summer day, floating halfway down the runway and nearly impacting an obstruction well past the end of the runway. So what is actually happening? Ground effect reduces the downwash from the wing, which reduces induced drag and increases lift. Remember the flat vortices from this Fokker 100 on landing? Watch how ground effect reduces the downwash from the wings moving the flap vortices out to the side. At the correct approach speed, ground effect will be minimized. If you do get caught in it, be ready to power up and go around. If there's still room to land, resist the temptation to flare early, or you can end up climbing out of ground effect and stalling well above the runway. Instead, hold a reasonable nose attitude and allow the plane to gradually settle onto the runway. That's it for this video. In part six, I'll do some touch and go practice in the pattern, then conclude with a summary of the danger zones and all of my tips for avoiding them. Those will be in a list, so you can take a screenshot and have a pocket reminder to review before your next flight. By you, of course, I mean future me, since I keep making mistakes and need to keep learning to improve my landings. I hope anyone else listening in finds them useful too. Study hard. There might be a pop quiz at the end. Until then, keep your wings in the air and your troubles on the ground. And oh yeah, grease one on for me.